Hello everybody, my name is Kai Wehner and I work as technology evangelist for Confluent. In this talk I want to talk about Apache Kafka and machine learning. A very hot topic these days and we see that at a lot of customers and how they leverage that in their use cases. I want to show you how to build analytic models with different frameworks. In this case I use H2O but the same is valid for others like TensorFlow, Deep Learning for J or many other frameworks available on the market. And what I want to demonstrate to you is how to build analytic models and then deploy them to an Apache Kafka environment to run them in a mission-critical, scalable way to use inference to do predictions on new events in real-time or near real-time, depending on your use case. The agenda for this session is the following. First, I will talk shortly about machine learning and real-time application. What's the business case for this? Why are companies doing this in the meantime and what's the goal for you as company. Then I will talk shortly about Apache Kafka and machine learning, how they are related from an architecture perspective. Before I then really go into the how-to and the live demos, where I first show how to build an analytic model and then how to deploy that to Apache Kafka with the Streams API to apply an analytic model to new events in real time to do predictions. Let's begin with the first part, machine learning in real-time applications, as a little bit of motivation, let's say. The definition at the first, so machine learning, what does that mean? In, in summary, it allows computers to find insights in without being explicitly programmed where to look. And that's exactly what we see in this picture here. Here is the computer, and in this case it's reading books, but it's really getting a lot of data inputs, much more than humans can process quickly. And um, that's why we need machine learning in um, cases of big data and complex data structures, many different data inputs. The machines can easily learn that and build models, which you can then apply to do predictions. That's the main reason behind machine learning and its subcomponent deep learning. Let's take a look at a few real examples of machine learning. So the first one which we know for 20 years is spam detection, which as you know is very hard to do as human or with if-else programming as you classically write Java code or so, where you do if-else and for loops to decide if something is spam. That's not possible to write for billions of different spam messages. So you need a model behind that and a computer which helps you to decide if something is spam with a specific probability. That's always important for machine learning. It's always about probabilities and not just a yes-no decision with 100% or zero. This got much more powerful uh, many years ago. For example, the search engine vendors like Google or Microsoft use machine learning to optimize their search results and to do product recommendations, um, advertisement, where they make their money with. And in the meantime, every person gets a personalized, context-specific result and advertisement. This is getting even more powerful. So since a few years, for example, if you upload pictures to Facebook, um, these pictures are then detected and analyzed by Facebook. Under the hood, this is powerful machine learning and deep learning which you need. And on these pictures, Facebook can analyze to find your friends, the locations you are, the products you use, like the smartphone or the beer you drink. And this way they again can make much better personalized um, recommendations and advertisement for you. Around one year ago, um, Google announced with AlphaGo that they bet the first professional Go player. Go is a game much more complex than chess. And in the meantime, they even stopped this project because it's too strong. It beats all the professional Go players. And this evolution here simply shows how machine learning gets better and better and stronger for many different scenarios. And now, as you see here, this is examples from tech giants. They use machine learning for many years already. And now it's coming also to your company. And that's what I want to talk about, how you can leverage that in traditional business cases also. So we always think about machine learning and deep learning in picture detection, speech translation, and these kind of things for tech giants. You can also leverage them in your uh, scenarios, of course, but there's much more regarding traditional use cases where you can leverage it. 
Let's take a look at a few examples where we can use machine learning to analyze and act on critical business moments. It's different windows of opportunity, right? So often it's about real time, but sometimes it's even about hours. That does not matter. You can leverage machine learning anywhere. So in seconds, it's important, for example, for fraud detection or price optimization or things like cross-selling because you want to make an offer to a customer before he left the store or before he has left the website. Sometimes it's about minutes, like in logistics, where you do things like transportation rerouting. It's about customer service, where you have a customer on the call on your phone and your agent, and machine learning can help you making him the right offers or giving him the correct answers, which um, are the right ones for exactly this specific customer. And sometimes it's even about hours or days or maybe even weeks. For example, things like predictive maintenance, where you replace parts before a machine breaks. Or you think about inventory management, where you send um, new ships to your stores um, before they are sold out, but also not sending too many. This is all about complex algorithms, probabilities, and therefore machine learning helps you doing this instead of building your um, custom rules by yourself, which are not that powerful. So here you see many um, use cases which you already implement in your industry, but with machine learning you can make them much more powerful. Let's now think about how is Apache Kafka related to all these use cases and machine learning. And that's what you really see uh, many customers already how they do that. And here is a um, very general overview. Um, in the middle, you see in the end Apache Kafka is um, distributed commit log and messaging and processing. And what you do, you have all your input systems which generate data. This can be mobile apps, web applications, legacy databases, or whatever you need to integrate into your Apache Kafka, where you then can send the messages forward to the do things specifically for machine learning. The first thing in machine learning is you have to build analytic models. This is where you use big sets of historical data to train and build analytic models, which you can then use in real time or near real time in your production app to apply machine learning to do predictions on new events, like cross-selling, predictive maintenance, fraud detection, picture analysis, and so on. And here Kafka is really the central nervous system, which gets all your input feeds as events, and then you can process that for model training and for um, model inference. So there is two different options here in machine learning. You can do that in batch mode. This is what I mostly talk about in this session, where you, for example, train a new model every day or every week and then deploy the new model to your um, production app. Some tech giants like Netflix already do um, online model training. This means for every single new event which is incoming from the databases, you um, retrain and optimize the model. For example, they do that for their um, recommendation of new movies which you want to watch. Um, this is not really that sophisticated and much more complex. So most customers we see still do the batch training for models. And for most use cases, it's sufficient. But here you see with Kafka in the middle, you can do it in any way. And not just important for training the model and deploying it, you can also use Kafka, as you see here in the middle, for um, doing configurations and feature analysis um, before um, you deploy the model or while it's deployed. And also then um, you use Kafka for monitoring the outcome. So what's the results of the model? What's the accuracy? You can do that by using Kafka again as central nervous system to send it to an elastic cluster to analyze the outputs or any other tooling you use where you want to get the feed still. This is mainly um, an overview about Apache Kafka can be leveraged in machine learning deployments, no matter which other tools you use around that for machine learning, right? So therefore, let's take a look at a more specific example with um, different technologies and frameworks. Um, a lot of colors here, so um, to get an overview, the blue ones in the end is the input and output data. So here you see some legacy databases, you see um, IoT stuff, um, whatever the input is, it has sensors or other interfaces to get the data into Kafka. <laughs> From Kafka, then you can um, first do the training of the model. In this case, we use really a big data analytics store, in this case Hadoop or Spark, and some frameworks or like H2O or TensorFlow. In the end, you can choose here whatever you want depending on your use case. And what we see in the meantime is that customers do not use just one data lake, but really focus on the business problem they have and then the specific technologies and data sets for that.
Then you build your analytic model and in the second part you deploy to real time to the streaming platform, which again here is Apache Kafka and in this case you also use Kafka Streams where you deploy the models to. So here you see again in green the deployed models, in this case two examples with H2O and TensorFlow. You first build them, in our case in batch mode, once a day, once a week, and then deploy them to Kafka Streams. These, in this case, um, they are deployed on Kubernetes, but here you could use anything like a plain old Java application, a web application, Apache Mesos, a Docker container, whatever you want to deploy your application to. And Kafka, as you see here, is the central narrow system to get all the input feeds, both for training the model, um, for inference, for monitoring, and then also sending the output to other systems where you want to do something with that. Like just maybe monitoring tools like Grafana or another IoT device where you want to do some action. So this is a high-level overview of a typical um, de deployment where you use Kafka in the middle, a central nervous system, to leverage it for machine learning, for both training and for inference of the analytic model, and then also for monitoring the results of the model. Let's now go to the um, real-world example which we built on how to. In this case, I use H2O, um, but as we will see, we could build an analytic model with many other things. The important thing really what you think about here is the model has to be scalable. And that's always a challenge um, to work together with data scientists and developers. So there are many different technologies and in the beginning you have to think about how do we need to scale, how does it have to perform and then you can choose the technologies. Here again our architecture to think about that. So again here now we build our analytic model on training data, on historical data so that we can later deploy it in a second step to a real-time system. Let's talk shortly about different frameworks, languages and tools for data science and machine learning. Most data scientists want to use R or Python. They are really built for doing machine learning and deep learning. And that's what data scientists want to use. And the challenge for you is to bring that then to a scalable mission-critical deployment. Because R and Python do not really scale. That's the huge problem with them. There are other things which do scale, like Apache Spark or H2O as some examples. And um, the good thing is that often these tools offer APIs for R, Python and other things like Scala or a simple web UI for the business user. And you can leverage them together to scale them out on Spark, H2O, TensorFlow or other clusters, but still use your preferred um, API interface. There are also specific frameworks for deep learning. This is coming more and more as one subset of machine learning. For example, I really like Deep Learning for J or TensorFlow, um, but others like MXNet are also coming more and more, and even the traditional ones like Tiano um, are very successful in many use cases. There are tools I mentioned here to, to open source tools like NIME and RapidMiner. These are visual coding tools um, which you can use to quickly build um, analytic models. And there's a few standards like PFA, the modern one, or PMML, the a little bit older one. This is simply if you want to use different tools for building the analytic model and then for deployment. And you can use a um, um, standard here. PMML is XML based and PFA is JSON based with different trade-offs and pros and cons um, to share models. We often do not use these standards because they also add overhead and are not really major or for every use case. So it's really again a trade-off of using a standard or simply deploying a build model directly to a production system. So in this example today I used H2O. Um, the reason for this is that H2O um, has a few advantages over some other machine learning frameworks. It's open source um, and a key thing is it scales and it's very fast. So here um, you see they market it as nano fast scoring engine. Um, this is a marketing term but we really build many um, different models which execute in a few microseconds and that's what you really can do then for real-time processing and that's what different from using just an R or Python model. Another advantage is, as you see here on the top, um, you have different interfaces and APIs for that. In the live demo in a minute, I will show you the R um, interface and also the web UI, which you can use for do it um, with more or less configuration instead of coding. And then under the hood, and that's also important, um, it scales out. You can, for example, scale it um, to an H2O cluster or leverage other systems under the hood like Apache Spark or Hadoop, which are built for big data scalability to train and build the models. 
So we use H2O to build analytic model and later deploy it into Kafka cluster with Kafka streams. There is also further development, for example, with Deep Water, which is a part of H2O. You can build sophisticated deep learning models. Um, there are many frameworks supported under the hood, like TensorFlow or like MXNet or Cafe. Um, the important thing here is you can use some pre-built models, like um, what we will do here. Um, we will use a gradient boosting model, but you can also define your own models with that. If you want to build a custom model, if the pre-built models are not sufficient for you and still use the advantages like scalability. As I say, in this case, I use H2O, but there are other frameworks like Deep Learning for J or some things around TensorFlow and many others, um, which you can use in a similar way and then leverage them and deploy them to Kafka too. So um, let's now come to um, the, the building the model. So sorry, I went too fast. Um, here we now will do a live demo. In this live demo, we have the use case of airline flight delay prediction. So we have historical data set of um, flights of the last 20 years and we want to use that to predict on new flights if a flight is probably delayed. As machine learning algorithm we use a grading boosting method using decision trees um, but in a similar way you can use many of the other ones um, like um, logistic regression, like deep learning, autoencoders and so on in a similar way. In this case again with TensorFlow. So let's uh, take a look at this example. First, um, I show you what I started. It's not much. I started um, the H2O server, which is more or less simply a char file, which you download, and then you start it with one command, and then you can run it locally. Um, if you want to use it on top of Spark or another cluster to scale it out, you have to do a little bit more configuration. We first use the Flow UI, which is a web UI, to build our model. But I will later show you also the, um, the R or Python code. Just um, before I start the live demo, I also have a GitHub example project where I deployed um, these examples with Kafka Streams and where I use the build models. So you can really simply use a Maven command to build this project and then you can run the examples and take a look at the source code. Here then I use pre-built models which I um, added to the project, but you can also build your own models as you see now in the live demo and add them to this project to apply them to Kafka later. Here now we have the Flow UI of H2O, a web interface. The API in the end is the same as R, Python and Scala, but here I use a UI to configure it instead of doing the coding, which is um, simpler for demonstration. In the real world, typically um, many data scientists use the coding environment because you can do more powerful things there. Let's begin with this example of the um, prediction of flight delays. First, we want to import some data set. Um, here I use a very simple data set. Let me just go to my notes and copy it. Um, it's a simple Excel sheet, which is um, a few megabytes. So um, this runs on my local laptop. If you have big data sets, you can scale it out on distributed systems using AWS or Spark or something like this. So um, here we now have our um, file, our zip file with some um, data. And we click import it. Then as next step, we parse the data. So here you see the typical steps now of a machine learning project. You analyze the data, um, you process it, you build the model. I do not focus on things like feature engineering here, which is of course one of the most important parts of a machine learning project. So here now you see the data set with all the columns like year and month and so on. You can also configure and process them here. So for example, you can use some enums instead of um, numeric values for where it makes sense. This is the typical steps which the data scientist does um, in, in his project. So then we parse this data here. This just takes a few seconds because we use for demo a small data set. And then we view it. So here we also we see um, the um, parsed data and also already some things like um, missing data, statistical information like min and max. So this is already important information for the data scientist and his analysis. But we now want to go directly to the um, next steps in machine learning process. First, we do a split frame so that we can use data to train the model, 75%. And then we use 20% um, to, tra uh, to validate the model. And then we still have 5% to do further predictions afterwards. Let's create the split frame so that we can use the three frames afterwards. Here they are. In the next step now, um, we can already build our model. So let's go to the build model step. 
Here now you see um, you can choose many different algorithms. In this case, this is all pre-built um, models which you can configure with hyperparameters to build your um, concrete specific model. As I said in H2O, you can also build your totally custom um, model and also apply that here. We in this case use a um, gradient boosting machine, which is some kind of um, decision trees under the hood of a, for an ensemble learning method. And we now here configure our training set and our um, validation set. And n false, we do just three um, to have a simple cross validation here with three false. What we want to predict here is the is arrival delayed. Right, so this is the important thing, and then we also choose um, which um, attributes we want um, to use to build the model, which features. In this case, it's important um, to remove some ones like the departure time, um, because that is already a huge predictor, and, and it's only real overfitting. It's not about prediction. If you already know what the delay was or where the departure time was, the real departure time, not the scheduled one, um, then it's um, it doesn't make sense to build this model. So we will use data like the year, the month, um, the scheduled arrival and departure time, the flight number, um, and we will remove some um, like um, the the real data. Um, so the airtime can be used, um, maybe not the arrival delay because that does not help for the prediction. Other things like the taxi in or taxi out might be interesting, we use that. Um, um, so here you can simply play around and choose the data you use. Um, we may not ignore the is arrival delayed because that's what we want to predict. And now with this case we can now set some more configuration here. This is all advanced stuff, we will keep it as the default is, but here if you want to do a more sophisticated model you can play around with that. And now we build our analytic model here. So in this case, as you see, it takes just a few seconds because for demo purposes, we build a very small model. Um, it's probably not the best one then, but therefore it only um, takes a few seconds to build a few different decision trees with gradient boosting. And then we can take a look at our model. Here we see our model, we see the um, uh, log loss, the cost function. Um, we see some other information here. So um, in this case, um, some of the um, model did not work and this is one of the reasons because the arrival delay was used which is not a good parameter here. This is one of the examples where the prediction does not work well um, because um, so here I um, have to um, avoid these two. So um, I did it the wrong way, I'm sorry for that. So we have to activate the ones which we want to use here and only then the model will work. So day of month for example, the scheduled departure and arrival time and maybe the flight number, the airtime, the origin, destination, distance, taxi in, taxi out. And let's take it again. Is arrival delayed? And build our model. So here you also can see how interactively you can play around like in the real world if you want to build a machine learning model. Typically the first one is not the best one which you're um, gonna build. Now it's building the new model again. And in this case, I'm just building one model. Um, you have also options to embed many different models of H2O and also to do automatic feature engineering and so on. This is more sophisticated stuff. So here now let's view our model again. So in this case, it looks better. Here we see the um, loss function. And here now we see also the ROC curve. And here we see the area under the curve um, with 85% um, true positives. That's pretty good already. Our first try here, right? You also see the important variants, the important variables like the origin and destination. This makes sense. So, for example, a flight from San Francisco might be more often delayed than a flight from, I don't know, Denver. The year is important because probably this got better over time with more um, sophisticated logistics software. What's also interesting here, for example, taxi out is very important for predicting delays. And so, here we have our first model. And now the important thing now um, is with this model, and that's one of the great things of H2O. This um, H2O, you still use a web UI or Python or R to build the model, but it generates Java code for you. I mean, you can use a plain old Java object in this case, which is generated Java code. In this case, it's decision trees, as you see here. 
I don't really understand what's going on, but that's the generated model. And as it is Java code, it scales very well. You simply deploy to your application. And also, um, it executes very, very fast. Um, H2O, as I said, with um, uh, decision trees, for example, typically takes only a few microseconds to execute. And that's really real-time, and that's what we need in a like, scalable Kafka deployment. So that's the model now we build, and we can export that and build that into deploy it into our uh, model in a minute, into our um, um, real-time application. So here I use the web UI. Let's shortly show you also our code. This does the same thing. So the, as I said, the AP web UI is the same as the R or Python or Scala code. I first import the code, then I do my preparation. I do the different split frames with the um, training, validation, and prediction data. And then I build my gradient boosting model. In this case, I configure um, some learning rate and some other things. That's the same configuration you could do in the web UI also. And then we analyze the model here. Um, that's, of course, easier for us now in the web UI. But data scientists also do plotting or so in the, in the code here. So I just want to show you also the same as possible with code in R or Python. And then you still can generate Java code in the end um, and then deploy it afterwards. So let's go back to our presentation here. This was the first of the two steps, how to do that. Um, we built our analytic model. And now in the second step, we want to apply that model to real time to do predictions on new events with this model. And here we leverage Apache Kafka as discussed in the second section of this talk. So we are back here again. What we did first, we built our analytic model on historical data. Again, we use the batch mode, which we could do once a day, once a week, once a month. You could do similar things with online training also, where you use every single new event to train a model. In this case, we built our model with H2O. And now we deploy our model here with H2O to a Kafka Streams application, which we can use in our streaming platform to do real-time predictions on any kind of new event, wherever it is coming from. We could use Kafka Connect to add new events from any um, database or other uh, Hadoop system, for example, to process that in real time. We can directly use Kafka, uh, Kafka clients from any language like Java, Ruby, Python, whatever technology you have. And then here we apply the analytic model on this incoming event. And then the outcome is again sent to another Kafka topic, either to a um, Kafka client, to a consumer, or via Kafka Connect to any other system, um, or even via REST proxy, for example, to a web application, to a mobile device, and so on. So I think you get the point here to use the streaming platform in the middle to leverage machine learning for training, applying, and monitoring the model. Let's first talk a little bit about stream processing in Kafka Streams and then how we apply that. The key difference of stream processing is that you do not do request response anymore, like you do with REST communication or SOAP web services, where you send some information to a, um, a data storage like a database, and then you request an output after that. What you will really want to do and need to do in many use cases, like fraud detection, cross-selling, predictive maintenance, is to continuously process the data. You continuously process the inputs and get some outputs back. Data in motion. That's what we are doing with stream processing. To explain that on one more slide, in the end you have many different events as input data, and then the processing time goes on, and you create different windows here, like a sliding window or a session window for different web user sessions, or even fixed windows like here. And then um, you analyze that um, to aggregate the data and to do other stream processing um, things here. A typical stream processing pro uh, pipeline has many different things. So after the event is generated, you first ingest the data via messaging directly to Kafka via an API, via Kafka Connect. And then you do pre-processing. This is transformations like filtering out non-important data, doing transformations or enrichments. And the most powerful part is then the stream analytics part, where you either apply contextual rules, which you configure by yourself or with a rules engine, or you apply other patterns, or as one part, you apply machine learning. Before then, you set the data after stream processing is used to your output systems, which can be a search engine, a data warehouse, a data lake, a mobile app, or anything else. The key part here really to understand is that applying the analytic model is just one piece of the stream processing puzzle. And that's what we focus on in this talk, right? And therefore, you see how easy it is to embed machine learning models into stream processing with Apache Kafka and Kafka Streams API. 
two more words about Kafka Streams and when to use it. So um, here in the end is a very simple um, demonstration of when to use it, um, which um, Jay Krebs, our CEO, used in the beginning to introduce it. In the end, we try to do a powerful thing, which is based on Apache Kafka, but also to keep it simple, like a Kafka and Suman. So um, it's not as complex to set this up with your own cluster, um, like Spark, Flink, Storm, Heron, whatever you want to use. You just use the Kafka Streams API, and that's mainly the goal, to have a powerful but simple stream processing solution. The great advantages of Kafka Streams is you can run it anywhere. Just in a Java application, like I will show in my demo um, in the IDE, you can deploy it to any WAR file or use Puppet, Chef, other um, CI CD tools. You can even deploy it on a Yarn cluster, in a Docker container, or on these new orchestration frameworks like Mesos or Kubernetes, or simply directly in the AWS cloud, um, in Azure, Google. Wherever you want to run that, you can do that. That's very cool. You have other advantages. You don't need a big data cluster. Kafka Streams is just a Java API, which you can embed to your application. This can be a big data cluster, but this can also be a local Java char, which you run locally or maybe distributed in Docker containers. You can deploy it into your infrastructure. That's the important thing. You leverage all the benefits of Kafka under the hood, like scalability and failover, because Kafka Streams under the hood also uses the Kafka consumer and producer APIs. So it's just Kafka what you're using in the end. And you can really focus on your business development in your department, and also the same is true for machine learning now. So here you see different departments with different use cases. You don't focus on one big data cluster, but you run it in your infrastructure. Some might use a big data cluster, others just a Java application, others Docker. You just use Kafka Streams and leverage the Kafka cluster under the hood everywhere, but you are independent of each other developing it. Here you see one example of a Kafka Streams application. It's pretty simple. In the middle, you have the stream processing service, which you can deploy anywhere. And um, the input and output are Kafka topics, which you use, which are then uh, related, deployed on a Kafka cluster. A complete streaming microservice ready for production at large scale. We also here use the word count example like um, in big data examples with Hadoop or Spark. The difference here is a continuous streaming word count because we do stream processing. So it's not a batch mode where you do it um, for hours or so. It's really for every new event you continuously process the data to the, to the continuous word count example. And um, this is really a scalable mission critical stream processing implementation. You do some app configuration here, for example, tell them where a Kafka broker is and do um, configure the, the serializer and deserializer. And then you define the processing, that's the key business code, where you define your streams to do things like filtering or later also apply machine learning. And also important here, you could also use tables. So tables are a first class construct in Kafka streams besides streams. So it's very powerful and so you don't you have to external databases or large clusters. You can use it on site where the streams application is deployed on each node. And then you start the stream processing. That's the three steps you do. Configuration, define processing and start the process. And you can scale this without any different um, configuration to a real cluster, mission critical, scale up, scale down, fail over and so on because under the hood it leverages Kafka. Let's go back now to our live demo and our use case. We are back at our airline flight delay prediction demo. In this case, again, we use H2O, but I really want to highlight again. Um, you can use that with any other technology like TensorFlow, Deep Learning for J. The important thing is that in the end, the generated model has to be scalable and performant um, so that it um, allows you to solve your requirements which you have. In my GitHub project, which I showed before, um, I also um, have another example of TensorFlow already and applied it to Kafka Streams. And I will build other ones like Deep Learning for J in the next month also. A streaming platform uses Apache Kafka Core for messaging and the Streams API to deploying a model. Let's take a look at that. So for that, um, we go to our um, source code. In this case, I use Eclipse as Java IDE. And first thing, I want to show you the Java code of the analytic model again. This was the first step um, where we built the decision tree with gradient boosting. And this code is now what I really use in my Kafka Streams application. 
In this case, I manually added it to my project, but typically in the real world you would use continuous integration and delivery with things like Jenkins and Maven to automatically bring that into your um, repository to keep it up to date every day, every week, or even if you build your own models with online training models, then you can do that also the same way. And here now is the source code. It's not really complex, it's a, a little bit of stuff. Let's go um, through that. So first we create our analytic model here. This is the H2O object. This could also be something like TensorFlow, Deep Learning for J. It's a um, pretty similar thing, um, typically. And then we do our configuration of our Streams application. Nothing special here. Um, the key really then is we define our input topic, in this case airline input topic from the Kafka cluster. And then we build our stream processing. In this case, I do not many um, typical stream processing things like filtering or aggregation. I focus on a for each loop so that I can add custom code to each event which is incoming. And the main code here is really this line here. For every single new input event, I use um, the H2O um, operation um to infer my existing model to new events, to every new row. In this case, we get input flight information and then we apply the analytic model on that to make a prediction if the model is delayed or not. This is in this case simply a yes or no with a specific probability. This is what the model returns us. And this is then what in the next step um, I send as output to the airline output topic where we then can process it, send it to an IoT system, send it to an Elasticsearch cluster to analyze it, to do monitoring, to monitor the accuracy, whatever you want to do in your application. That's this simple um, but very powerful Kafka Streams application. And now um, I simply will run it. Right? It's that simple. So first I want to show you I already started um, our Java a Kafka consumer, which is waiting for the um, airline output topic to get um, our predictions. And then now we start um, this application here. You really see this is a plain old Java application. I use it in this case as public static void main. It's a pretty simple class, nothing more. And the same way you can use it with Docker, Kubernetes, Mesos, in any application you want. It's just a Java API which you add to your application. This Kafka Streams application is now running and is waiting for input. So let's go back to our console and on the top you have the consumer and on the bottom I will now um, create some data. Here you see, um, not here but in my other file, I first um, create some test data. This is the, um, the flight information. This is a flight from 1987 with all the other information we have about the attributes like um, in this case um, the destination airport is San Francisco for example to see some of this um, and also the flight, scheduled flight departure and arrival is in and all this data which we choose. Now as next step what I do I simply send this um, data to a Kafka console producer which sends it to our airline input topic. From this input topic, it goes to the streams application, and then when I now click return here, it sends the output to my consumer. So let's take a look. So here we have sent it, and you already see um, here is the output. Is the airline delayed? The answer is yes. This is the outcome of our model, which was applied in Kafka Streams in this application as I went through this a few minutes ago. And here you also see the log info, that is the input of the flight information. Um, the prediction is yes, and you also see here some class probabilities of this model, um, which this model um, prints for you here. We can use um, another data set. So in this case, um, we use the gradient boosting model of decision tree, so it's always the same output for the same model. It's not something stochastic, which might happen with deep learning. So it's um, interpretable pretty easily. And so here now we will see, um, I will use another example. And I will again send it to the Kafka producer to do it to the out airline input topic. And here we will sound, you know, and prediction of no. So this is just two examples, but now imagine you have a real airline system with input feeds of IoT data or other APIs, and you get millions of data here. You can easily scale that with Kafka Streams, and then um, even scale this application easily. It's just a char application, which you can scale out with Kubernetes or Docker or any other thing. You can build it into your web application, or what you want to do with that. The failover and scalability all leverages Kafka under the hood, and here you can, in a powerful way, apply machine learning in a very fast and performant way here um, to this Apache Kafka application.
So even if you have an existing application and you just want to add machine learning later, it's easily possible by simply um, add your machine learning model to the Kafka Streams application here. So this was my demo about how to apply, apply this um, to real-time processing with Apache Kafka Core and the Streams API. Once again, to highlight, you can do this not just with H2O, but with any other framework which um, has the SLAs and, and allows the performance and scalability which you need for your uh, scenario and use case. Here again, um, how we did that. Um, we simply use different stream processors like filtering um, or one of these um, tasks then or the stream processors was applying the H2O model. Here's some screenshots for reference how we did that. And as I said before here also for reference the link to my GitHub project. Right now I have examples for H2O, for TensorFlow and more examples like Deep Learning for J um, or XGBoost or others will be implemented here. And I will also implement more powerful um, framework examples here like um, for example doing a more complex thing like model training or also monitoring of models and sending the accuracy back to another input, maybe using Elasticsearch or so. So I will do a lot more here. Maybe one thing which I see on the bottom right is unit tests. That's the one other thing I can show you. In this Maven project, I also, for my examples, always build a unit test. This, um, under the hood, uses an embedded single node Kafka cluster for testing. And this is classical J unit tests. Here you see the same test data as I showed you in a live demo. And this is a classical unit test which I built for machine learning here. This simply helps you running the example first and understanding what is going on with the assertions here. And also it demonstrates how easy it is to also build um, a real continuous integration pipeline even with unit tests for machine learning systems. So let's um, conclude the session with the key takeaways. Apache Kafka Streams API allows to build scalable mission-critical real-time applications. It's just a Java API you can embed it anywhere. Um, you don't need another big data cluster. Every organization or department can focus on its own business application and leverage Apache Kafka under the hood. It can run anywhere. It's really Docker, Mesos, Java application, web application, in the cloud. It doesn't matter. You can run it everywhere. And um, you can combine it with machine learning easily to build, train, apply, and monitor analytic models, depending on your use case. In our case, we used H2O um, to build the model um, on, on historical training data set in batch mode, and then deploy it every day, every week to our real-time system. You can also do this continuously or with online model training. So Kafka can help in every step with building the model, inference, with monitoring, and the whole pipeline and mission critical scalable deployment around that. This was my session about Apache Kafka and machine learning. I will do other sessions in the future about more sophisticated examples and also about use cases. For example, to use anomaly detection with deep learning autoencoders and implement an example and go with you through that. If you have any questions or feedback, please come back to me. I'm really happy if you give me feedback, if you contact on me with LinkedIn. I really appreciate any kind of feedback. And now, thanks a lot for watching this.